Oh, I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave. And it could be just you and me. We'll be family. Just wait and see. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Lung Cancer Living Room. We're so happy to have all of you joining us live tonight. Um, as you may or may not know, uh, tonight we will be talking about screening and treatment options for early stage uh, lung cancer. So thank you, thank you. For those of you who aren't familiar with our Living Room program, it's a support and education series created specifically with the patients and caregivers in mind. Um, the goal, as I've said in the past many times over for those of you who aren't newbies, um, is to bring to you live and in real time educational talks from key opinion leaders in the lung cancer community in a format, in a uh, language that's easy for everyone to understand. Um, we know that people watching tonight and those that will come back and watch post live come from around the globe and consist of people living with varying types of lung cancer, undergoing various types of care. Uh, and we want you to know that we're here for you and that we believe wholeheartedly uh, that educated and empowered patients do better. So thank you for joining us tonight to uh, learn a little bit more uh, about what's going on in the lung cancer space. Tonight we have uh, Dr. Jonathan Lishock from NYU Langone. Um, he's a radiation oncologist and the medical director of NYC uh, Cyberknife at Perlmutter Cancer Center in Manhattan. So thank you, thank you, Dr. Lishak, for joining us. Um, we spend a lot of time in the living room, as most of you know, talking about diagnostics and treatment options for later stage lung cancer. But tonight, uh, we're gonna be focusing on the early stage diagnosis, uh, more specifically, the role radiation therapy plays in treating early stage lung cancer. Um, as with most cancers, catching it early creates opportunities, as you know, for better outcomes. Um, we're also going to be discussing the new USPSTF, for those of you who aren't familiar with that acronym, uh, it's the United States Preventative Services Task Force. So we're going to be discussing the new guidelines for lung cancer screening, which opens the door uh, to screening for lung cancer to roughly 16 million people in the United States today, recognizing, of course, that most of you watching, <clears throat> excuse me, have already been diagnosed. We hope that you'll find this information valuable and that you will help us spread the word on the importance of getting screened so that we can catch more lung cancers early when we know it's most curable. You are our best advocates in spreading the word to your neighbors, to your family, and to your friends that may qualify based on the information you learned today to go and uh, get screened. We talk a lot in this program about multidisciplinary care and you as a radiation oncologist are a very port important piece of that care team. Can you briefly explain what the role of radiation oncology is in lung cancer? In Great question. I mean, uh, treatment for, for lung cancer is really a team sport. Um, and that's one of the exciting parts about being in this field that you work with um, tremendous specialists from uh, radiation oncology to medical oncology to surgical oncology, um, radiologists, pathologists. It's really this intersection of, of a team of specialists that kind of come to bear on really complex issues. Um, and in terms of radiation oncology, you know, I think if you look at lung cancer as a whole, the radiation oncologist really plays a role from, from very, very early stage and even sometimes before diagnosis occurs all the way into later stages of lung cancer. And so we do see that con con continuity of uh, patients throughout this, this, this journey. Um, and so as far as radiation oncology goes, this is a, a field where you are trained in every type of uh, cancer um, throughout the body and, and treating radiation um, in conjunction with surgery and, and, and systemic therapies, including chemotherapies and targeted therapies. And so, you know, it is a, it's, a, it's an amazing intersection of, of technology, of multidisciplinary um, interactions um, to kind of come, come to bear on, on uh, challenging cancers such as lung cancer. That's great. I appreciate that. And I think we're going to get 
and you know a little bit later in the program into talking about sort of breaking down the fear factors that might be associated um, with radiation therapy in general. Um, but for right now, I want to start in that screening space. And as I said, this is a really important piece to me um, because we know, um, as with other cancers where screening has been available for a lot longer than it has been for lung cancer, um, that we are finding those cancers early, breast, you know, colon, prostate, as you mentioned earlier. So let's talk a little bit about screening. I was going to say let's go straight to the new guidelines, but maybe we should talk about where where we were prior to these new guidelines and maybe how we how we. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, if we look at the most common cancers that we see in the U.S., um, oftentimes they're the most common because we screen for them, and screening is a it's a very challenging area. Um, because you have to have a, a good amount of data to support a screening test. Um, we obviously have screening tests for a variety of cancers, including prostate cancer, we use the PSA. For breast cancer, we use mammograms. For colon cancer, we use colonoscopies. And so all of these screening tests have allowed us to detect these cancers earlier. And the earlier that you can detect a cancer, really the more treatment options you have, and ultimately the better prognosis that you can see. Now, lung cancer has been a real challenge for many, many years because up until the last five to 10 years, we really haven't had a screening test available to us to be able to catch these cancers. Um, there were a number of trials that try to use chest X-rays, which are, are really a, a, not a, the best way to screen for lung cancer. And those trials didn't kind of show that. Um, they weren't effective at, at identifying um, these cancers and bringing kind of a reduction in lung cancer mortality by using that method. But um, uh, 10 years ago, and more recently with a different publication out of, out of Europe, we um, looked at using CT scans, which were essentially three-dimensional x-rays, and allow you to kind of go section by section through the, the lungs to identify small lesions that could be um, concerning. And so um, uh, these CT scans can have various radiation doses. And, and for the screening purposes, we use low dose uh, CT scans to screen the patients. And um, it wasn't until these trials came out that we identified a test that could be used to identify these cancers earlier um, and reduce the lung cancer mortality in patients that are screened. So really it has been a panacea um, in, in terms of lung cancer screening. Um, one an additional interesting thing that they have uh, seen in these trials is that not only can you reduce um, lung cancer death, but also all-cause mortality, which is a big issue. You can identify other issues, cardiovascular disease, thyroid disease, other types of lung disease. And so um, that's a pretty impressive uh, piece of information for a, for a screening tool to identify. And so I think what we've seen that has been so important is trying to pull um, the, the more late or advanced or metastatic lung cancers that we were previously diagnosing so late that we couldn't make as big of an impact into earlier stages. And, and it's been a really important um, movement in the field of, of lung cancer. So we talked a little bit about, or you talked a little bit about um, the trial that was done here and then overseas, so that being the NLST and then the Nelson trial, um, which equated to what? Like, what were the original guidelines based on the findings of, of that? That's a great point. I mean, really, we can't, we can't screen everybody. And I think this is a lesson that we've learned um, with the PSA and, and mammographic screening. You know, I think sometimes we, the pendulum swings a little bit too far and we over screen. And so what you really have to do when you're developing a screening test, which is very challenging, is to ter determine high risk individuals, at least with respect to lung cancer, and um, in, uh, utilize that screening test for them. And so when you look at the trials that you, you just mentioned, um, they looked for higher risk patients that may be um, compared to the background population at a higher risk of developing lung cancer. Now, one of the things that we know, uh, and we've known for about 50 or 60 years, 
is that smoking is clearly uh, related to lung cancer. It's causal. And um, we identify patients that have screened a certain um, amount um, over, over time. And we also utilize whether or not they had quit smoking in a certain period of time and their age. And, and so taking those, those things, those three factors together, you can identify a higher risk patient population that would ultimately benefit from this screening test. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, you know, having worked in lung cancer advocacy for 15 years or so now, yes, I know that, you know, the one of the leading causes of lung cancer is smoking, although you don't have to smoke, as you know, to get it, um, which causes sort of this sort of butting of heads, if you will, with those folks out there who might think they're at risk for for reasons that might not be within the qualifying criteria. And we're not going to jump down that road right now. I just want um, just to kind of state it as, as you know, fact. When, it, when we're looking at um, who currently qualifies, it's based on data that we have historically, right? And data that was showed within these two trials that we, that we outlined. And um, that doesn't negate the fact that people who never smoked um, because you do have to have some smoking history or be a current smoker to current to qualify based on current guidelines. But that doesn't mean that um, that we're ignoring those of you who maybe have a long family history of it or or who may have grown up, you know, where the radon levels are, are very, very high. And, I, and I'm mentioning this because we get calls about this all the time. They're like, but wait, what about me? Right. And so I think this points back to a very important point that we always like to make during these lung cancer living rooms is um, the importance of engaging and being involved in studies. So as studies will come up that will help to further expand the guidelines for who might qualify for screening and or as screening becomes something different than maybe even a low-dose CT, it's important that there is that yet to be patient participation. So I just kind of wanted to throw that out there. We use data and guidelines and standard, you know, numbers here. Uh, but you know, a patient isn't isn't um, a data point. They're not a statistic. And I think um, it's important if you're concerned to have that conversation with your primary care physician and talk to them about, you know, your family history and your smoking history, et cetera. It's it's if you go down the the screening pathway, it really needs to be an, an open discussion with your physician about the the risks and benefits of, of moving forward with uh, that type of screening, given your, your medical history. Great. Thank you. I could not agree with you more. So let's talk a little bit about these new guidelines. And I know um, um, we have yet to, you know, fully solidify the reimbursement piece of this. But if we talk about who currently uh, qualifies and those 16 million people that I talked about a little bit earlier and how important it is that we get those people in the door to get screened. Um, what, what do those guidelines look like today? So the, Who qualifies? The, two, the two major resources that we have for guidelines, the United States Preventative Task Force is probably the, the major one. And as of 2021, um, it's adults aged 50 to 80 who have a 20 pack year smoking history who have currently, currently smoke or have quit within the past 15 years. Now, what pack year history, that is kind of a convoluted term. But what that means is if you smoked one pack per day for approximately 20 years, that's considered a, a pack year. So, you know, I know there's, there is some confusion as to maybe you smoked a, a pack a day for a period of time and then decreased or increased. So it's a little, it's a little convoluted there, but that's a rough guideline if we're looking at numbers based on the USPSTF. Now, like you mentioned, I think it's an important point uh, to bring up. There are uh, other organizations that we do um, as oncologists uh, look towards, and NCCN guidelines is, is another um, uh, kind of guideline source that puts out recommendations. They're, they're a bit different, but you know, fundamentally, they're all pulling from that, that main trial that we mentioned earlier um, and uh, looking at pack years of smoking and, and age as well. So there's a little bit of minutia there, but that's fundamentally what, what um, those 2021 guidelines are looking at. Yeah, I think that's important because I think with the original guidelines, it was roughly maybe 11 or 12 million people today that qualify. 
Um, but just by expanding that age bracket and the pack year history being shortened a little bit, we brought that to 16 million. And I think one of the biggest sort of bummers, if you will, for me is that of those 16 million people nationally, roughly 4% actually make it in the door and get screened. And, and why do you think, um, Dr. Lishok, that that number is so low? And what do you think we need to do to, to, to increase the number of people that qualify actually? get? It's a great question. You know, it's something that we have to work on in, in the medical community. Um, you know, I think there's a number of things. You know, one of the one of the reasons is is just a, a temporality. This is a kind of a new kid on the block as far as screening goes. And and as we already mentioned, the screening guidelines even went within the last five to ten years have changed. Um, and so uh, it, it, I think it might be a bit of a moving target. But we got to get the word out into the community. And I think that starts with primary care physicians. Um, you know, these are these are the the first point of contact for so many patients. Um, and, and, and for screening purposes, whether it's lung cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, et cetera, um, that's really where that interface is, is going to be happening. Um, of course, in my own practice, you know, what, if I'm seeing somebody for prostate cancer, I think it, it's very important for me that I also screen them for a lung cancer if they are eligible. And so it's going to take, you know, um, a lot of outreach within the community um, and conversations like this that are so important. Uh, to get the word out. What role do you think um, sort of s s stigma may play in this? And I think about this on a very personal level. I, I grew up in a very large Italian family where most of my family members smoked and they didn't just smoke a little bit, they smoked a lot of it. And some of them still do. Um, and there there is an aversion to screening because they don't want the the finger wagged in their face, right? They don't they don't want to be made to feel bad for this addiction that has sort of overcome their their ability for rational thought behind it. Do you do you do you see that? Do you think that that plays a role in maybe those low sort of numbers along with what what you're also talking about? Certainly, you know we have to get past that. Um, you know we can't stigmatize patients. This is. This has been the number one leading cause of mortality uh, from a cancer standpoint in the U.S. for a very long time, um, and, and we need to put more money into uh, research. You know, I think if you look at the other uh, heavily researched um, areas of oncology, we could use more in, in lung cancer. I think it's really important that we we get past the stigma um, uh, of, of smoking. We know that it, it's associated, but there's, that there should be stigma associated that with, from a patient standpoint. Um, if they're going to get screening. So I think that's a really important point. And I, I think, you know, when you're having an interaction with a patient in, in, in a room, um, you really need to make sure that you don't make them feel like this is, this is um, you know, you've brought this upon yourself. This is not what we're, what we're about trying to do here. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And when I think about sort of the numbers and my numbers may be a little dated, I haven't, I haven't checked up on them lately. But when I look at smoking related diseases, right? Outside of even cancer, I mean, look at heart disease, right? They think the statistic says that 80% of people who, who smoke will wind up with some form of heart disease, yet there doesn't seem to be that same sh shame blame aspect, I guess, associated with it. And I, I, I look forward to the day that it's the same for people who are getting screened for, for, for lung cancer. And, and I really believe that not only what you were saying about, you know, primary care physician awareness around how to have these conversations, having these conversations for one with their patients who qualify, but how to have these conversations, right? In an, in an empathetic way that allows them to feel comfortable moving, moving forward with, with screening. So I'll get off my, my sort of soapbox about it right now. Cause I could take up a whole living room, um, talking about, about stigma and, and feelings that in my experience have been associated, um, with, with patients and close family members in particular, but again, I'm being mindful of time. So somebody goes in for screening. What does that look like? We talked about low dose CT, and again, there is this fear factor sort of associated with radiation that might be associated with with um, CT scans in general. What can a patient expect 
when they go in for their screening. Fundamentally, what it is is a CT scan, uh, which is a, a three-dimensional X-ray that's going through the thorax and looking through the lungs um, to identify any areas that may look like um, at-risk. Uh, we call them lesions before we really know what they are, um, but they could be nodules. They could be kind of areas of haziness that are within the lungs. There's a number of ways that, that these types of um, processes can manifest with CT scans. And so what you're doing is you're getting these scans typically on an annual basis and checking to see if there are any areas of concern. Now, if an area of concern is in fact identified, um, there is really a, a number of pathways that you, you can ultimately go down. And it really depends on what the lesion looks like. And so these are conversations, um, for instance, here at NYU, we have an entire uh, lung, uh, lung cancer screening program that's um, staffed by pulmonologists and other physicians that are specializing in this, that look through these scans to identify areas that, that are concerning and then triage what actually will happen next. And what can happen next can be anything from as benign as a, a repeat scan in a year or maybe earlier, or an additional type of scan known as a PET scan that gives you some more information that's not necessarily what you would find on a CT scan, or even a biopsy. You know, biopsy is going to ultimately tell you whether or not you're looking at a benign or a cancerous process. But there are a very, uh, a pretty wide range of what can happen depending on what that area or that lesion looks like in the lungs. So basically the follow-up differs is what you're saying, depending upon what the radiologist sees on a scan and then is then transferred over to the treating physician, correct? So let's talk a little bit about um, the fear of radiation exposure from um, the place of like a CT scan. And I've heard other physicians, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but say that, um, you know, it's one of those things where if I'm on a flight from out here in San Francisco coming out there to visit with you in New York, the radiation levels that I'm experiencing on that cross-country flight are actually maybe a little bit even more than what a patient might be exposed to during a low-dose CT scan. Is that fair? I could have said it better myself, yeah. And you know, depending on where you live in the country, if you <laughs> live somewhere that has some natural <clears throat> background radiation, um, such out in Colorado or certain areas um, similar to that um, flight from New York to California. But yeah, you know, when, when, with anything in medicine, yeah. it's really, um, it's cost-benefit analysis. And, and that's why finding that sweet spot for a screening test is so important. Um, but ultimately, if we look at the doses of radiation that are being used for a, CT scan, a low dose CT scan, it's extremely low. And, and the benefit for high risk individuals far out, say, outweighs the risk. I love being able to share that sort of bit of information with people because it's not like when you show up at the airport, there's a big sign you know, before you enter the plane, letting you know that you're about to be exposed to radiation. I think most people don't even know that that's a thing. Most people are exposed to radiation in various levels and, and don't ever think about it yet when it comes to their own care because of maybe misinformation that they've gotten through the years. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, there is this, this fear and this sort of taboo associated with it. So anyway... Let's jump into staging. So we talked about screening. We've talked about those people that qualify. We've, we're going to jump into a little bit about the importance of finding, you know, lung cancers or any cancers early. Um, but how, how is lung cancer staged? And, and more importantly, for purposes of this conversation, what would constitute early stage lung cancer? Yeah, so, so staging um, is something that we use for any cancer. Um, and every cancer has a specific type of staging. And for the most part in um, oncology, we use what's known as the TNM staging. And, um, you know, we, we, we use staging for, for fundamentally a, a, a couple of things. Number one, it's important to figure out the outcome and prognosis to have educated conversations with patients. And it's very important to figure out the stage to determine what the next steps are going to be in terms of treatment. And so um, that's what the stage is useful. And going back to TNM stage, what that actually stands for is tumor nodes and metastases. 
and that basically evaluates the um, the stage, the aggressiveness of the cancer um, at the time that you've caught it. So to determine that stage, we need a number of tests. And for lung cancer, those tests will include imaging, such as a CT scan, um, as well as a PET scan. And a PET scan, similar to a CT scan, gives you anatomical inf information, but also metabolic information. Cancer cells divide very, very rapidly. And if you give a certain injection to a patient and then get a scan, you can identify where that injection is going to based on how rapidly those cells are dividing. So it can identify areas that you would otherwise not find on a CT scan. So a CT is very important. A PET CT scan is important. An MRI is another imaging test that commonly is used for um, lung cancer. Um, that's kind of like a high definition picture of what's going on in the brain. You know, we do certain types of imaging tests for different cancers because certain cancers have predilections to spread to certain areas. The brain is one of those areas for lung cancer. Uh, in contrast, like prostate cancer, we give a, get a different type of uh, scans. That prostate cancer tends to go to the bones oftentimes if it's more advanced, so we get a bone scan. And so the diagnostic text tests that you get to stage are very are intricately related to the type of cancer that you're dealing with. So CT scan, PET scan, MRI, but of course to ultimately diagnose a cancer, you have to get tissue. You have to take a look under a microscope at what you're dealing with. And for a lung cancer, you get tissue from the area in the lung where you suspect there is cancer. So um, there are a number of ways that you can get that tissue. Um, you can get it uh, via bronchoscopy, which is a camera down the throat when you're uh, under some anesthesia, um, where the this pulmonologist can go through and biopsy the area and the lymph node that he's concerned about, he or she is concerned about. Um, you can also get a surgical biopsy, and that's done a number of ways. Um, so, to, Or uh, you can have a radiologist put a needle right through the skin into the area that um, in the lung that, he's, that he or she is worried about. Um, and so that's how you get the initial tissue of the, 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 the primary tumor or the T stage of the um, lesion, which is uh, related to the size and the location. Now, um, I mentioned that there are some areas that uh, are at risk of, of cancer spreading to. And one of those areas is lymph nodes in the middle of the chest, kind of the center of the chest here. So there does have to be an evaluation of those lymph nodes. And that's similar to biopsying the primary area that you're concerned about. That's done surgically or with a bronchoscopy. So those lymph nodes are sampled, especially ones that you may see that are, uh, that are enlarged on a scan, a PET scan or a CT scan. And so that's ultimately pulling all that information together uh, you're you're able to um, um, figure out what stage lung cancer you're dealing. Um, and to go back to your original question, early stage lung cancer is really typically a, a tumor that's on the smaller side that doesn't have um, lymph nodes involved. And that's one of the bigger things that distinguishes it from more locally advanced processes or um, metastatic processes. When a, a nodule has been identified that needs further evaluation, should all people expect exactly what you're talking about with the CT scan, the PET scan, and the brain MRI? And if it's not being given in that sort of trifecta of diagnostics, should it be a conversation that they're having with their physician? Absolutely. This is all very complex um, process of, of obtaining scans. And there are certain situations where you wouldn't obtain an, an MRI of the brain, and some that you would. Um, for the most part, CT and a PET scan are pretty uniform, but getting the biopsy um, is a very complicated process. And you know, th this, this is the type of um, decision-making that requires really everybody that is treating lung cancer at a um, hospital to sit down and um, look over the scans and the information that they have and determine the best next diagnostic tests and ways to biopsy and evaluate um, the process. Thank you for that, and I, I, I don't want to digress too far off sort of the flow of where we're going with this, but a couple of times it's come up, this sort of team effort. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, this multidisciplinary team and this tumor conference or tumor board approach to um, collectively coming up with the best next steps for anyone 
individual patient. Well, honestly, it's one of the things that I found so fascinating when I was a medical student going into the, you basically go into a room once a week, you sit down at a big conference uh, table, um, you sit around all these specialists that have all been educated for a decade and a half and kind of brought to arms their their experience on a, a given problem. And you just go case by case, patient by patient, um, and you, you all sit in a room, um, look at the information and um, come up with the, the best next plan. And there, sometimes there's uh, conversations and arguments to come up with that best plan, but ultimately that is the goal. What What is the best next step in the best treatment for a given patient? And that's why everybody sits down to that. And you have surgeons and radiation oncologists and medical oncologists and radiologists, pathologists, residents, medical students, everybody in that room. Sometimes, you know, we routinely have tumor boards here that are um, 40 to 50 people. Of course, right now they're all remote because of COVID, but um, you know, the, these, this is a lot of minds coming to bear on one, um, one patient every time you, you talk about a case. And so it's, I find it one of the one of the ex very exciting parts of, of being a radiation oncologist, bringing everybody together, having that conversation. Yeah, and I I thank you for clarifying that, and I think it's Im important for me and for go to and some of the education that we try to roll out across our lung cancer community is the importance of this multidisciplinary type care. You know, it's one thing for a hospital or a cancer center to have physicians that work in medical oncology and pulmonology and radiation oncology, you know, in surgery, in pathology, you know, radiologists, but it's another thing entirely for them to be coming together in the decision-making process, right? So um, thank you for, for, for um, clarifying that. So we got one question online that before we jump into sort of this treatment sort of phase um, that I want to touch on. And the question is, are there commercially available blood biopsy? Um, are they sound enough for lung cancer patients who might want a little bit less of an invasive biopsy type procedure? Where are we with liquid great, biopsies? Great question. Um, you know, the liquid biopsy, and I, I presume we're talking about, um, well, when we think about biopsies and also liquid biopsies for screening, you know, it's it's an area that is um, really actively being explored from a research standpoint. And certainly there are certain types of cancers um, that we can use uh, liquid biopsies for evaluation of, of certain mutations, um, for certain lung cancers that are associated with um, different mutations. Now, um, it's not routine, it's not used for screening. You know, that goes back to uh, our conversation about low-dose CT scans. And it's not used for all lung cancers, but I will say that a, a method of getting um, information that's very sensitive from some type of biomarker that can be obtained by, um, you know, just a, a blood analysis is something that in oncology we have been really ex heavily exploring over the, the last 10 to 15 years. And, and hopefully we'll see uh, more advancements in that field as time goes on. And certainly we do have um, uh, some, of, some of that available for certain types of lung cancers, um, but not, not uniformly. That's great. And I think this kind of points back to what we were talking about earlier about participating in clinical trials and, and research studies, right? Because there is some work being done. As you said, the work has sort of been done, it's continuing to be done looking for uh, biomarkers and the, and the like in, in the blood. But there's also work being done, um, has been done and continues to be done looking to see if we can use blood as a potential screening diagnostic for all different types of, of cancers, not just lung cancer. But again, every time I can plug the importance of participating in trials, um, I, I want to. So I felt like that was a good opportunity. Um, so another question coming in um, from the diagnostic standpoint. So from, um, you know, nodule found, regardless of whether it was through screening or or maybe it was an incidental pulmonary nodule that, that was found because you went to the doctor for something else. They did a CT scan and this this spot showed up on your lungs. Um, from, from that original finding to CT scan, PET scan, brain biopsy, official diagnosis, treatment, what does that time frame look like? What should patients expect that time frame to look like? Good question. And it, and it, it really depends on the situation. Um, sometimes the situation can present itself much more comp complex and it, it can take a little bit more time to come to a, a final conclusion on 
what exactly we're dealing with and the best next steps in, in management. You know, I, I do think that in lung cancer, we try to move quicker. Um, you know, I, I, I think um, we look at on the order of month, um, weeks to, to, you know, a month or, or, or so in terms of getting things moving. Um, but that's really dependent on the institution and the situation. So it's kind of hard to give you a ballpark number there. But I will say that on on average, we, we move quicker with lung cancer than, than some other uh, cancers. You, you may read about other types of cancer, like prostate cancer, that you don't even actually need to immediately treat. You know, so there are a lot, there's a big range here. And I think uh, we move quicker uh, with lung cancer in that range. I'm a person who has just been diagnosed with early stage lung cancer. Um, and there are two sort of potential um, ways to cure this lung cancer. Can you can you talk about what those what those two are? Once you've obtained all your diagnostic tests, you de you determine that you have an early stage lung cancer. What's the next step? Well, you really have to decide upon um, two options: radiation therapy or surgery. And the standard of care for somebody who is eligible for surgery is surgery. But for patients that are not eligible for surgery, we consider them medically inoperable. Radiation therapy is um, the standard recommendation. Now, it's important to um, emphasize <clears throat> that both of these approaches are um, curable approaches. These are both the goal is for cure. Um, but you do have to determine whether a patient is um, uh, eligible for surgery, and that's really the most important next step after you've made that diagnosis. Now, um, you know, the types of surgeries and the surgical approaches and the outcomes, because I'm not a cardiothoracic surgeon, I'm, I'm going to defer and focus on, on radiation therapy. Um, so if you look back at, at the history of, of radiation therapy for lung cancer, early on, we really had not a very good track record. Um, up until, I would say, the early to, to mid-2000s, we just were not doing a very good job at treating lung cancer, in particular early stage lung cancer. Uh, and it wasn't until we developed newer technology, better imaging, better radiation treatment planning, that the game completely changed. And in that early 2000, mid 2000 period of time, we saw that if we could deliver high doses of radiation over a short period of time, something we call SBRT or stereotactic body radiation therapy, the outcomes that we saw in the 70s and 80s and 90s were getting blown out of the water with this, this newer technique. And so clinical outcomes improved, the control of the cancer improved, survival improved relative to the historical data. And so this really was a, a game changer for the radiation oncology community. Um, and so as time has gone on and the machines have gotten better and better, we've gotten better and better at, at, managing, at managing these early stage lung cancers from a radiation standpoint. I want, I want to jump a little bit more into to the, to actual radiation therapy, but I want to step back for a quick second and just ask a question. And, and this didn't come in from, from the audience necessarily, but my own curiosity. So we talked about <clears throat> the surgical option and the uh, radiation therapy option. Are all patients, regardless of their operability, made aware of these two separate options? Or um, is it just, well, if you're operable, we're sending you to the OR, um, and if you're not, Come see Jonathan. Well, you know, my, my experience has been, um, you know, just like when you have a tumor board and talk about various cases. Similarly, when you have conversations with patients, you can do it in a multidisciplinary <clears throat> clinic. And so I think being face to face with a radiation doctor and a surgeon to have that conversation is really, really important, um, especially if there's any ambiguity as to the operability. And so, you know, um, hearing about the different approach, um, hearing about what's involved and what um, side effects that could be uh, a result of this intervention. I think it's very important to have that conversation and kind of juxtapose. Um, and, and, and during these meetings, we also have pulmonologists there available to talk about um, you know, the, the outcomes that they see and how they follow their patients after these surgery or, or radiation interventions. And so 
you know, I think it's, uh, like I said before, it's really important to have uh, these multidisciplinary meetings, these conversations with patients. It really does um, uh, benefit the patient when they're making that challenging decision on um, where to move forward. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I was thinking more along the lines of, you know, a patient who may be, you know, just someone who's terrified of the operating room and the thought of being under general anesthesia, regardless of the type of surgery maybe being done, if, if they were actually considered in this. And I think it, it, again, points back to what we at GoTo are consistently trying to do, which is educate and empower our patients to know all of their options so that they can go back with their physicians. You know, particularly in, in, in more rural settings where maybe this multidisciplinary approach just isn't an option um, and have those informed conversations um, with their physicians. So um, thank you for clarifying that. So we got another um, question online that, that I think is relevant before we jump into what you know that you talked about you know before we jump into sbrt and cyberknife and, and and you know what all that means um what stage is considered early stage the specific question um uh, is uh, is is it anything before stage four metastatic disease so what what exactly are we talking yeah, great about question. Here? so you know i, I kind of think of them in, in three groups um metastatic which is the situation where the cancer is spread to another part of the body, and, and that's outside of the chest, usually. Um, so that's a different situation. That's typically the domain of um, medical oncology, but also more and more radiation oncology. We also have locally advanced, which is still within the chest, but typically involves either a larger portion of the lung and or lymph nodes within the middle of the chest. And so earlier stages to do not involve um, lymph nodes in the middle of the chest and are more manageable in size. And so, you know, the, the, those, those are rough terms that we kind of use um, with medical lingo. But of course, the, the specific TNM stage has to be looked in very closely um, when you're diagnosed to kind of determine which, kind of, which direction or which pathway makes the most sense. I know that a lot of folks, again, we talked about it from a, a, a even just going in and getting a CT scan and some of the fear of of radiation, and I think that fear is even greater when it comes to utilizing radiation as an actual therapy to treat and or cure your cancer. Can you talk a little bit about about why people shouldn't fear this as their grandfather or their great grandfather's radiation? What what we're looking at and and the the ability for current um, technologies to really pinpoint target. Um, these cancers. I think you made a great point. This isn't your grandfather's radiation. You know, you can almost think of radiation advancements like following the pattern of the iPhone. You know, we've seen we've seen improvements every year, every couple of years. You know, twenty years we didn't. Twenty years ago, we didn't even widely use cell phones, <clears throat> and, and and the technology technology that's advanced our field because it's so technologically heavy. We've really followed that, and 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 it's been just amazing. Um, the improvements in our machines, our equipment, our scans, our plans, um, um, because of this technological computer revolution. And so it is very different than what we were using um, even just 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, but, but you're right, you know, a lot of people are really scared and, and, and before their radiation treatment. And, and before I have a patient go into that radiation room, I always sit them down and and uniformly, people are pretty anxious. Um, but I will tell you this, once people come out of that room after their first treatment, and they're almost uh, upset that it was so anticlimactic. Um, but, um, you know, <laughs> I think part of it is is this is a very small field of medicine. Radiation oncology is, is really this, one of the smallest fields in medicine. It's a black box. And it's, 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 it's this aspect of, of medical care that even within, our, within um, the, the physician community is, is um, relatively unknown. But you know what, what we what we're actually doing? We're using X-rays and targeting them directly to tumors in a very precise fashion to eradicate the tumor and to basically achieve what what you would do with surgery. So, so we we call this radio surgery. Sometimes we call this a, a ablative radiotherapy. There are a lot of different terms that we use, but you know that's fundamentally the goal. And so it, you know, if I was going to describe uh, the process. You know, there's a lot of there's a bit of lead up to getting radiation therapy. 
it's kind of a you know measure two three hundred times cut once type of thing um so we need to get uh, a set of scans um, we we get those scans because we are um, trying to create our radiation plan or radiation target and for for um lung cancer patients, they're actually very complex scans we can we get a ct scan we also get what's called a 40 ct scan which is um, a scan that is obtained at 10 different phases of the respiratory cycle. Now, lung cancers are moving while you're breathing, and we're not going to make you stop breathing during treatment. So we really have to identify where that tumor is and how it's moving. And so we have very advanced um, radiation um, uh, scans that can actually do that, see that tumor mo move in, in uh, real time. We then create a radiation plan. This is a pretty complicated process. This is where I, get, I sit down and I, de I identify where the tumor is, where the tumor could be microscopically, and all the organs that are nearby that could pose a concern if they had excess radiation dose. So after I've kind of I delineated and identified the, those areas, I work together with a physicist to create a radiation plan to get in enough radiation dose to that tumor and spare the surrounding normal structures so that we can achieve a curative um, a radiation treatment and minimize um, radiation toxicity. Now, once we've created that radiation plan, there's a series of uh, quality assurance that the physicists and, and uh, physicians actually do before that patient comes into the, to the room for treatment. Now, once that patient comes in for their first day, um, they'll go into a radiation room, they'll lie down on a table, and they, there's a, uh, some imaging that's obtained to identify where the tumor is each treatment and while the patient is getting treatment, treat, treated as well. Um, and when the treatment is delivered, the, radiation, the, the patient simply lies on a table. Um, this machine will move over their body. They don't see anything. They don't feel anything. There's no cutting. There's no pain. There's no anesthesia. Um, this process will last anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes to 30 or 30, 30 to 40 minutes, and you'll get off the table and you'll go home. And that will happen, uh, those treatment fractions or treatment treatments um, are uh, delivered, it depends on the situation. It can be as little as one time, and it can be many times, you know, depending on the stage and the situation. Um, but that's kind of what, what it looks like, what that, that process uh, actually looks like. And I think it's so cool. And this is where I, and I just want to reiterate kind of what you said at like way layman's levels, but I think it's fascinating to me how with this imaging and this technology, you can not only map the tumor location, but the gate like of respirations, like, like it can follow the breathing of any said, you know, individual in order to, to really target the tumor itself, thereby sparing the healthy tissue that might be around that tumor. And I just, I, I, I tech, again, technology is amazing. It continues to get more amazing every day, but I think it's, um, it's a really, really important, you know, fact to drive home for people who might be looking at radiation therapy, whether it's in this early, you know, stage sort of place that we're talking about today, or even in later stage patients who are looking at, you know, at radiation therapy as part of their overall therapy in general, that it's just, it is not your grandfather's um, radiation therapy. So, um, so similar to surgery, there's a certain follow-up, right? That's, well, it's not even just surgery, just with treatments in general and what your scans look like. And what is, what is follow-up, um, what is the standard of care in follow-up post um, radio surgery or is this type of radiation therapy um, in early stage Great patients? Question. That's really important. Um, you know, the follow up after a cancer intervention is, <laughs> is, is so important. And, and I, I have these conversations with patients every day. You know, I, I think it's important to, to think about um, a cancer almost like a chronic disease. When you go into a primary care doctor and you have high blood pressure, every time you go in, they, they check your, your blood pressure and it doesn't stop at, two or three years down the line, they just check it because they know that you have high blood pressure and that's a concern. Well, I think oncology is approached the same way. And every cancer after that, that treatment or that intervention, there's a certain degree of surveillance and follow-up that, that um, comes into play. Um, and so for lung cancer, that involves scans, that involves CT scans most commonly. And they're, they're, I, they're um, obtained at different intervals. 
Um, and sometimes additional scans such as a PET scan are warranted. But I, we always wanna see patients back in clinic to see them face to face, see how they're doing, see if they're having any side effects from the treatment, whether the, the, the treatment was surgery or radiation or a combination thereof. Um, and so really, if you look at standard approaches, it's somewhere between every three, three to six months for CT scans. And depending on what you see, that may trigger additional tests or not, and just uh, repeat scans later, uh, later on with a follow-up. Follow-up, follow-up, follow-up. I think it's, it's so, so important. Um, so <clears throat> what happens if the cancer comes back? I mean, we know that even in surgical patients or patients who, who go to the operating room and, and have the surgery, that sometimes the cancer comes back. In this instance, when somebody has been treated with radiation therapy um, and during one of those follow-ups, it is found that, yes, the cancer has recurred or returned. What, what, what happens that's next? That's a great question. Um, so it really depends, and that's, that's the short answer. Um, <clears throat> so we get repeat scans, and let's say that there is something that is a bit concerning. Well, any of those initial diagnostic tests that I described can come into play again. So you could get a PET scan, you could get another CT scan or an MRI or a biopsy. So it could be a number of things. And what you end up doing if the cancer comes back really is dictated by where. Um, did it come back in the lungs? You know, one thing that is becoming more and more common, especially with uh, lung cancer screening, is identifying an additional lung cancer. Now, this doesn't mean that that lung cancer came back. It actually could mean that another lung cancer just grew. And so that is a very different situation than the lung cancer coming back, especially if it comes back outside of the lungs. And so we are seeing more and more of that. And as time goes on, I think we're gonna understand better and better um, uh, how to manage those situations, whether it be a combination of radiation and surgery or, or radiation or just surgery. Um, and so it really, really depends on the situation. Um, ultimately, there are a lot of treatment options that are available if the cancer does come back, depending on the location. And it really depends on um, a lot of factors as to what is then um, utilized. So one of the most important things I think you just said is for people, you know, we, we try to continually generate hope, as you see um, on the, the wall behind me as I'm sitting in where we would normally hold our um, in-person lung cancer living rooms while still streaming it live, but the room would be full of people, is instilling hope, is letting folks know that if the cancer did come back, that there are options, that that diagnostic process can be rerun, revisited. Sometimes second primaries are actually a thing, which is again, a whole uh, separate uh, uh, living room event one um, final question before I go to final thoughts, because we are winding up on the end of our hour, is uh, somebody watching live wants to know how involved is the radiation oncologist in determining cancer uh, treatment? And is it important for them to know treatment op options outside of radiation? Um, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, well, I think, I think our, our, I like to think that my opinion matters, <laughs> but, um, you know, I think, <laughs> I think that, um, in terms of understanding the other options that are available, uh, that that's one of the great parts about working with so many, um, so many other physicians. So you, you are constantly learning as a physician and you, we, as radiation oncologists are trained to, to treat, uh, every site in the body in any situation, but that doesn't mean that we understand every type of treatment um, for a given uh, disease site. But when you're sitting in, in conference or you're sitting in a multidisciplinary clinic with a surgeon and he's explaining to you the approach that he would take and what he would, how he would, you know, take out a certain tumor or do X, Y, and Z, you re really are learning a lot. Um, but having that expertise and working together is so important. So I guess it goes right back to that original Thing that we mentioned at the beginning, which is this is this is a team sport, um, and it, it's and I'm glad that it is. Yeah, I, I I for one will toot the horn of the radiation oncologists out there. It, again, in my you know decade and a half experience working with patients um, who didn't have the benefit of today's technology, at least not maybe early on, um, and those who do now, I've seen incredible results happen across the board with early stage patients, late stage patients, with 
you know, everything from palliative support to curative um, effect. So um, that's my personal answer to that question is I think you play an incredibly important role um, as part of the care team for lung cancer patients. So um, I will ask Dr. Lishok if he has any final thoughts or comments um, that he would like to make prior to uh, us closing out the evening. Well, I think in the last, since I started in radiation oncology, we, we really have seen um, dramatic improvements in lung cancer from lung cancer screening to identifying cancers early and treating them earlier for, for cure to the advent of immunotherapy, which has just completely changed the game for lung cancer and many other cancers. Um, to the improvements in radiation technology, um, the ability to get curative treatment with uh, minimizing side effects, and of course, all the, the various surgical advances using um, VATS uh, or, or robotic uh, surgical techniques that have, have, have come to the forefront. And I think you see all of these things have, having culminated in um, reducing um, the mortality associated with lung cancer in recent years, and that's really something that I think oncologists are, are proud of and, and hopefully that we can continue to see moving forward. Yeah, I love that. And I think um, that this whole sort of hope factor that, you know, I mean, I, I, again, I look at back in 2003, five, six, you know, when lung cancer first kind of became a really important thing in my life. Um, and what options were available now and how fast and furiously we've come to where we are, you know, 17, 18 years later. Um, when I first started, there, although we were, you know, kind of shooting for this hope sort of across the board, it was kind of hard to come by, right? And now when I look at it, it, um, it makes me so proud and so hopeful for what is still to come. Um, so I, I, for one, appreciate you and everything you do um, um, for the lung cancer community and the, and the patients who have the benefit of serving you. And I cannot thank you enough um, for joining us tonight. And hopefully once, once we get th through the pandemic and hopefully enter the endemic phase, um, you'll come out to California and, and join us live here in the living room um, and we can continue this, this uh, amazing conversation. So thank you so much. And I will close out again with a huge thank you to Dr. Lishot, all of you watching live or post live, Penn Media uh, for managing the back end of this and enabling us to bring this to you. Uh, Michelle Zay, who I think most of you watching know, who's who's on the back end um, helping to moderate chat, uh, and uh, Nicole Phipps as well, who's moderating, and any other go-to foundation staff who might be moderating tonight and or um, who pop in from time to time. We could not do it without any of them. Um, I would be remiss in thanking our, our very, very generous supporters. Um, without their support, we could not bring you this programming. Uh, Amgen, AstraZeneca, Boehringer Ingelheim, Bristol Myers Squibb, Daichi Sankyo, Foundation Medicine, Genentech, Lilly, Merck, Novartis, Regeneron Sanofi, and Takeda, Thank you so much for your uh, belief in the, the program that we were able to bring to our patient and caregiver community. Um, everybody enjoy your evening and we will see you uh, in a couple weeks. Oh, I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave. And it could be just you and me will be family just wait and see